Hey, everybody. Uh, welcome to Word Balloon Academy 2021, uh, presented by Seneca College uh, School of Creative Arts and Animation. Uh, my name is Miles Baker. I'm the executive director of the Toronto Comic Arts Festival, uh, and you are attending our first WBA uh, program of this year's uh, it's Do the Thing. Um, uh, with our fine panelists from Raid Studio, who are going to introduce themselves uh, in just a second. Um, uh, before uh, we get to uh, today's program, I want to take a moment to uh, acknowledge the original caretakers of the land that I am on, uh, the Haudenosaunee, Anishinaabe, Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation, and the Wendat peoples. I'm joining you today from my home, uh, which is in territory that was the subject of the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant, an agreement between the Anishinaabe, Mississaugas, Haudenosaunee, and Allied Nations. Uh, this area is also covered uh, by Treaty 13 with the Mississaugas of the Credit. I make this uh, acknowledgement today as part of a long process in learning what it means to grow up, live, and make art on colonized land. Going forward, TCAF is committed to increasing Indigenous voices and perspectives uh, in our program. Uh, and now uh, I think it is time for me to hand things over with Anthony as uh, we learn more about how to best get uh, your projects finished, your art projects finished. So uh, take it away, Anthony. All right, thanks, Miles. Uh, so yes, as Miles mentioned, we are the Royal Academy of Illustration and Design, or the RAID Studio. We're an award-winning artist collective uh, established in 2002 and located in Toronto's historic Parkdale neighborhood. Our primary focus is illustration, design, animation, film, and sequential art, comic books. Uh, but we've, of course, also worked on video games, storyboarding, you name it, we've probably written it or drawn it at some point. Um, one of the things that we talk about a lot is, is productivity, and specifically creative productivity. So what we had wanted to do was kind of put a lot of our own sort of personal thoughts and a lot of our discussions that we've had over the years into a nice cohesive talk for everybody to discuss how to get your creative projects finished. This might, maybe you want to draw, maybe you want to write, maybe you're a colorist, maybe you want to do anything essentially, you're a musician, whatever, but essentially the, um, th th this will be applicable to really any kind of creative endeavor that you do. Um, I'll uh, start off with um, talking a, a little bit first and then I'll pass it off to each of the uh, my uh, panelists here. Um, we'll introduce ourselves just that way it's a little bit easier. Um, as I had mentioned, I'm Anthony Falcone. I am a writer. Uh, and I've been working in the RAID studio for nine years. Uh, I work in novels, uh, comic books primarily, but really done a lot of a lot of stuff, technical writing, business writing, you name it, and I've kind of done it. So to start off the talk in terms of doing the, the thing today, I wanted to talk about the zero day, which I feel is like a pretty important concept because I think it's the zero day which really saps a lot of creative strength from us. And that's the day where you get nothing done. Just anything that you try to do, you just have nothing done. And then the next day, you get another zero day. Your zero day is multiply and then suddenly you have a zero month and you're going down a shame spiral and you're hating yourself and how will I ever be able to write and be creative and all this, right? So what we wanna do is we wanna make sure that you don't have this zero day. And I find that for myself to, to eliminate a, a, a zero day, is sort of, I, I, it, it deals with protecting my creative time and also with tracking my creative progress. Now, this uh, type of talk and what really all of us are gonna talk about, it applies to people who you know, are creatives as, as professionals and as their sole source of income. And it also applies to people who are doing it as a hobby, who are doing it as a part-time gig, who are doing it for fun. Like it, it, it doesn't matter. Any of this can sort of apply all along that, that way. So when I talk about protecting your creative time, what I really mean is you have to have a sense of your, your goal of what you want to be doing and then having an idea of how you're going to achieve that goal. So you want to have an op optimum goal. So for myself, I want to be able to try to write at least one hour a day. And in that hour, I want to get at least a thousand words written or I want to write at least two comic book pages or whatever, right? So I have that specifically set 
from or myself. Fantastic. But life throws a lot at you and you might not get that whole hour of the day, right? We're in the middle of a global pandemic. The fact that anybody gets anything done right now is fantastic. Be super proud of yourself. But the point is that, you know, my, my optimal day is that I will get an hour. But if I don't protect that hour, then I definitely won't get that hour. I will, will I have no chance of, of getting that hour. I have two small children. I have, you know, a, a, a other commitments. So I find that one, I have my creative space sort of set up as best as I can. I can write in noise, but I cannot write in mess. So I have to have it relatively clean. Um, I also try to write the same time every day that there's a reason that we actually, um, you know, like wh when we're in class, we kind of do the same classes at the same time every day is because your brain starts thinking, okay, this is math time, this is geography time, whatever, right? And so it's good to kind of have yourself use that same time each day to have some actual, you know, creative time put to yourself. But you might be super busy and maybe an hour might be this, you know, the, like it, it's a treasure if you get an hour to yourself. That's fine. What can you do then? And it might seem silly to be, okay, well, I can only give myself 15 minutes, but can you give yourself a whole 15 minutes where all you'll do is be creative for those 15 minutes? That's better than the zero minutes that you were just about to have, right? And that's how you get rid of your zero day. You know, whatever you can contribute and, and maybe it's different every day. Maybe you're hoping for an hour, you only get 50 minutes, you only get 10 minutes, whatever you end up doing. I myself try to make sure that I read every day and that I write every day. Those are like the two kind of key foundations for a writer for, for what you, you need to do. My, my writing time is generally around lunch uh, because then I, you know, can kind of take some other care of some other things in, in, in the morning. I, I used to have a much earlier hour to myself writing time before having children, but that's kind of gone away now. 7.30 a.m. is not is not key for that. Um, so I tend to write at lunch and then I tend to read just before bed. And I uh, again, as I have a writing goal, I have a reading goal as well, which is you either read one comic or you read 20 pages of prose every single day. And it just, you just try to, you know, actually ha have it kind of come up, right? Um, essentially, what I then get a chance to do is I, I get to track every single day whether I did or did not do the things that I wanted to. So did I write and did I read? I use an app called Coach Me, but you can use like a, a paper calendar. You can use whatever, right? But your whole point is you just want to be able to check off every single day. Okay, yes, I did something that day, right? I wrote, I read, I wrote, I read, I wrote, I read. And that way... You can, you can see in like a pattern how, you know, am, am, am I keeping that chain going? Am I keeping that zero day away from me? And if you do it for a long time, because I'm relatively obsessive about actually tracking everything that I do. And, and I, I know for many of you that might seem terrifying, right? To know, to have it, all that data staring you right in the face. But for me, it really helps to, to be able to say, okay, I've written this much or I've done this much. And what I've been able to do seeing over years is I know which months are going to be really problematic. Uh, November, for whatever reason, is a super hard month to keep the zero day away. December, really hard month to keep the zero day away. So I try then to like build that into my schedule and my plans that, you know, November and December, I try not to take on as much work. I try to have my own projects kind of set and, and, and done. And this way you're able to kind of, you know, be able to figure out uh, wh where your own like, like kind of pinch points are, and then you can keep writing or, and keep, keep working on stuff. Um, you also, I think, have to be honest w with yourself. Like if you're working two jobs, taking care of kids, you, you want to write, but at the end of the day, all you have is the energy to, you know, just like watch an hour of Netflix then you have to figure out something else for yourself, right? And maybe it's like, you just wanna watch a half an hour of Netflix and then you write for 10 minutes, right? Because if, if you wrote 150 words a day, at the end of a year, you would have a book, but there aren't that many people you know that write a whole book a year, right? So like small 
um, little contributions to your creative efforts really, really do add up over time. You have to think about creativity as, as a long game, not necessarily as like a, a short game. And I think that that's really where you'll be able to start finding some really, really, uh, you know, good successes because suddenly you have, you know, 10 days where you don't have a zero day and you look back and you're like, wow, I actually wrote quite a bit. I actually managed to, to draw quite a bit. Right. And, and that way it, it's, it's pretty, you know, um, it's pretty neat to, to see what happens from this constant application of your creative craft, even in small, small doses. Um, and that I think is sort of a nice, you know, bow on, on what I kind of wanted to say about the zero day and keeping the zero day away. And now, um, let me ask you a question about this before we yeah, move sure. on. Yeah, sure. I'm curious, sure. how does this scale or shift depending on whether you are making time to develop something of your own versus being under a production deadline? So, um, I because I so, so I have had a day job like all all the way th through my creative endeavors, right? Like the the creative writing that I do is not my sole source of income, right? So I've always had to find additional ways of, of, of kind of, of doing things, but a paid gig deadline, it's much easier to keep the zero day away for that because it's a job. It's, it's like anything else, right? So like, it's like, it's like mowing the lawn. It's like, it's like, whatever, you just have to do it because it is part of it. It doesn't mean that it's that like the zero day doesn't creep up on those too, right? Because there's a certain degree of Parkinson's law sometimes where like, if you have too much time for, for a, a gig, you'll, you know, it, like you'll have zero day creep in. But, um, but it, it's much harder to keep a zero day away for my own works that have nothing as, as the sequel to the, to, to my novel will, will say, right. Like, and, you know, like that I had wanted to have finished about what, two weeks ago. And I probably have another month, month and a half worth of work. Now, again, Everybody needs to be really, really easy on themselves this year because we're literally in the middle of a global pandemic. So like, don't be too hard on yourself if you don't manage to hit all the deadlines you have. Um, but I, I developed a, a, like a lot of these kind of ideas when I was working on my own stuff. So by the time gigs like came along and paid stuff, it's very, very easy to make sure that, that, that they're kind of done. I also find that in some ways a paid uh, project is, is easier in the sense that every second you're working on it is money, right? So if you take longer, then your, your, your rate is going down, right? Like the, the, the longer that you actually work on something. And, and so that, that's generally why I, I find, you know, a paid gig really helpful to kind of keep myself moving along. Yeah, I guess there's built-in structures there, right? There's yeah. the performance pressure, the deadline that pushes you. You're talking more about protecting those things that are important, but not urgent. Yeah, well, and, Where, like and life gets in the way. You, you need to make sure you're still pushing your own goals forward, even though they're not yeah. tracked according to a schedule where others will be disappointed. You got to keep moving forward on the things that matter to you. Yeah, because and like one of the overarching things that is just such a mantra for me, as Kalman will attest, is that done is better than good because done is how you get to good right like, like i'm i'm such a believer in having a crummy first draft of something that then you can fix late, later on right and because when, once you have a whole thing that you've finished you can move on to the next thing you know? uh and with that i think i'm going to pass it over to ramon so give yourself Great, a short intro first, Ramon. That's me. Hi there. Um, I'm Ramon Perez, uh, freelance artist, uh, illustrator, and uh, managing director of Raid Studio. And Ringmaster. Ringmaster, yeah. Um, I've been freelancing now as a career uh, for about 25 to 28 years. I've kind of lost track even when you you know kind of think about how long you've been doing this, but, um, and the whole time I've been freelancing as an artist, I've never really held down what I would call a, a real job. So the onus on me to motivate myself and make sure work gets done 
has always been on my solitary shoulders, even though you might have editors pestering you or clients pestering you, it really just relies on you to make sure you get things done. Uh, about 10 of those years, I freelanced from home. Uh, whether this was right out of school, I freelanced out of my father's home where I had a little bit of a studio space. And at the point where I felt I could financially sustain myself, I moved and got my own apartment, which was a studio style apartment where I had a studio in my home. And then about after doing that for about 10 years, I was invited to join the Raid Studio by uh, Kagan McLeod and Chip Sadarsky and found it arrived at the perfect moment because after freelancing for about 10 years from home, I was getting a bit antsy. Uh, more distractions were coming my way. The internet had become a thing and had uh, offered new distractions that were no longer uh were, which were harder to avoid basically because you know before you'd have to maybe your bookshelf or your dvds or blu-rays you'd watch something or go for a walk grab a coffee or whatnot but uh the internet provided a whole new means of distraction so joining the studio was a great way um to allow myself to focus and create accountability through uh, the presence of my peers um, and that's kind of what I want to talk about in my section of our discussion, which is space and compartmentalization of what we do um, to make ourselves more efficient as freelancers. Uh, so as I said, you know, this will apply to those who um, are either at home or in a studio space, whether there's a solitary studio space away from your house or in another space shared with other creatives. But basically, um, what I found helped me quite a bit was dedicating a space in my home or eventually what became a studio that was dedicated solely to work. Uh, working from home from 10 years really showed me how work can kind of just find its way into all aspects of your home. You'll have scripts sitting on the back of your toilet. You'll have comp copies on your living room uh, coffee table. Uh, you'll be you'll be reading uh, the, the emails from your art directors while having dinner. It's just everywhere and you can't escape it. So and in my first space after I left home and lived in the loft, my literal space was a bedroom and right beside the bedroom was my studio. So I literally would wake up, see my studio, you know, work, work, work and then fall asleep and just fall into bed. And it became an unhealthy scenario where it was the first thing I saw. It didn't give me that moment to, I think, give myself time and then dive into work. So to help myself, um, I, I, I tried to separate my space. Now this might be easier in a home where you might have a little uh, extra room where you can make an office or whatever it might be. Uh, but I didn't have that luxury and people maybe living in a bachelor apartment or maybe in their home with their parents, they have their room and maybe a corner of the room. Um, I ended up purchasing uh, a very large six panel Chinese uh, screen. It was like eight feet high and about seven or eight panels wide. So it, it, an accordion to about, uh, I think it was 12 feet almost. And I used this as my faux wall to separate my studio from my 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 bedroom my home whatever it might be and so when i got up the first thing i didn't see was work it was a beautiful you know etched panel with uh flying birds and clouds it was just a nice antique piece of artwork but it, it was allowed me to separate the space then i would wander down to my kitchen have a coffee you know watch a cartoon or maybe read a comic book and then i would wander back up and enter the studio space and getting my mind to do uh focus on work so, and this is what I've eventually, eventually created with joining a studio space, creating a separate space now from my home. Uh, when, when I come into the studio, it, uh, it's solely work time for me. It's like going to the gym. Uh, when you join a gym, you go there to work out and that's that. You don't go there to socialize. You don't go there to uh, read comic books. You go there to work out. And essentially that is what the studio space is for me. I come here, I mean, there is a social atmosphere. I'm in a space with other people, but at the end of the day, we, we, all the people here are here to work and inadvertently inspire each other by working and, 
and allowing each other to focus on that time, but also giving each other some social interaction for breaks and uh, healthy things. So, uh, so one thing as a, so moving on from compartmentalizing your space is now uh, compartmentalizing your time. And this uh, as a freelancer is very important because you will have sometimes one project on the go, or you might have three or five projects on the go. And you kind of have to figure out what's important and in what order and how much time you should dedicate to each project uh, to make sure you get it done on time and on deadline. Um, so I usually try to do this. It's kind of, you know, there's no real formula, unfortunately, but I try to look at uh, projects and divide them by how big is this project? How much time would it take me to do this project if it was the only thing I was doing? And how much time would I have to dedicate uh, to do this project on a daily basis to get it done for my client? So it could be, for example, if I work on a comic book, uh, like I am for right now for the Skybound in doing Stillwater. Uh, Stillwater uh, and Skybound allot me five weeks to do a 20-page comic. And I know that kind of breaks down weekends off to about four to five pages a week, realistically four, but it allows you to, you know, a little bit of wiggle room. However, that's, you know, a prime scenario. I usually have two or three projects on the go. So I tend to dedicate uh, certain hours of the day to different things and different projects. So when I come in to my studio space, I will often dedicate the first hour or two uh, to having my coffee and going over emails and any kind of client correspondence. And once I shut down uh, the client correspondence, usually by around uh, 11 a.m., I usually get into the studio around 9.30 or 10, giving me an hour to do this. Um, I shut that down for the day, unless it's a priority email that comes in. I don't answer any other emails to the following day. Uh, I then embark on the rest of my day, which is drawing or uh, designing or layouts or whatever it might be. So I'll look at my day and I usually allot myself a six to eight hour day from that point on where I'll block in uh, time. So whether it's a four hour window or a six hour window. So right now, I look at, uh, for example, doing layouts. I know layouts, I can do about 10 pages of layouts in about three to four hours. So I allot that amount of time. And this is based on experience. You'll, you'll figure this out as you go along, but I allot that amount of time. And then once that's done, I will move on to the next thing I've uh, put into place, whether it's being designing a cover or whatever it might be. Um, and you, because your time is uh, very important and you want to make sure you apply it as efficiently as you can. And in all this time management or compartmentalization of projects and space, you also want to work in things like lunch or taking a walk, getting some fresh air. Uh, as a freelancer, I know that sometimes you can get knuckled down, you get in there and you forget to eat after eight hours, which is yeah. great because you're focused, you're getting things done, but at the same time, you're also not eating and it's you know nice to get a bit of fresh air on a sunny day and stretch your legs, get a bit of exercise. So I have found for my efficiency, I try to work in uh, regular breaks uh, and they can shift around because if you're in the groove, you don't want to get out of the groove and just get up and leave. But you know if you're if you're missing your 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 marking point for taking a walk, then delay it by an hour, but still go take that walk or do a bit of exercise or whatever it might be. Um, and, uh, and then the, I guess the last thing going forward would be uh, kind of based on the multiple projects element, but also a lot of us tend to do things like work on independent projects, which don't necessarily garner us any money, are not client motivated. Um, and that would be things like web comics or, uh, or graphic novels that you might be working on. And the same thing applies in this regard. I would basically like for example for myself these days i am writing a graphic novel and slowly trying to work up uh, a backlog of comics for relaunching my web comic uh, cuckoo Boom. so both of these things are non-paying gigs at the moment they're done of my own free will and i have to dedicate x amount of time to do these things uh no knowing myself knowing leaving myself to my own devices these things would not get done because i would just focus on my client work and the thing that uh, you know pays the bills, make sure there's food on my table. So I dedicate now 
every Monday from 6 p.m. till midnight to work on the writing aspect of my graphic novel. This blocks in uh, a nice window of time every Monday for me to tackle X amount of chapters or pages on my graphic novel. And this works out well for me because going back to uh, how I manage my time, Mondays for me are uh, an office admin management day where I don't draw. I dedicate all of Monday to doing uh, admin management, whether it's uh, putting together newsletters, planning my social media for the week, um, working on uh, client correspondence or that sort of thing. So it's a very kind of dry day where I don't really focus on anything creative for the most part. So knowing that I have blocked off my Monday nights to end on a creative note, which kind of warms me up for the next day where I'm drawing. And, uh, and then on Sundays, uh, I work on my webcomic. I block off an X amount of time on Sundays to either pencil, ink, or color my webcomic, which, you know, allows me to keep uh, a sort of warmed up feeling so if I, if I don't draw for a few, uh, too many days, it's a bit of a rusty getting back into the groove. So this allows me to kind of warm up for the week uh, by drawing my own stuff, which is fun. It's, it's what I want to do. It's my own ideas. I'm more, a bit more engaged than I am sometimes, if you will, with client work. Because client work is somebody else's ideas. It's what you're doing for somebody else. So this is a great way for me to kind of uh, create a catalyst for my week where I'm warming up on something I truly enjoy and want to focus on. Um, and at the end of the day, uh, you know, if, if, if you're running beyond your allotted, allotted times on what you're, you're not doing, or say, for example, you're not feeling it that day, as Anthony mentioned, the zero day, um, the good thing is you can always shift compartments around. So say, for example, you're not feeling drawing that day, look at what you have scheduled for the next day. Maybe it's some admin work, maybe it's some panel layouts instead of, uh, finishes, shift your, your compartments around and make them work so you can always uh, focus on something and get things off the ground. Uh, with that, I'll hand things over to Danish uh, and he can talk about his little segment and we'll answer any questions at the end of the panel overall. Hey, thanks Ramon. So I'm Danish, I'm an uh, illustrator, editorial illustrator and a comic book artist. I have been with Raid now for, I would say one and a half years because I don't count the pandemic as time <laughs> it's just, I don't know what it is. So uh, what I'm going to talk about is kind of, you know, it's related to what Anthony and Ramon talked about. And it's just about being able to focus on today, like just the, the idea of today and not worrying about, you know, how much you have to, how big the project is or how many months you have to work on something. So for example, right now, I'm working on a project that's, it's a graphic novel. It's 170 pages and I have, to, there's four stages. So I have, I got to do my rough layouts, my pencils, my inks, my colors, and uh, that's it. So I got through the, the layouts fine because those are pretty fast. And just so that you know visually about how I work, I have like, I have every page on one layer in Photoshop. Like, so I can see, so if I go, if I zoom out on Photoshop, I can see all my pages. So I can see all 168 pages. And it's good because it just, I can uh, navigate to different pages depending on what I want to do. But it's also bad in a way because now when I started on page one and there's 167 pages left, then it was like, okay, I'm doing one page. And normally for about, four pages of pencils, it takes me about three hours, say. But I would spend, so I would spend about an hour on that one page on that entire, out of the entire comic book. Then I would zoom out and I would see that what I've done was like, look like nothing. Like I spent an hour <laughs> on this little page. And then it was like, it was like really demotivating because I'd constantly zoom in and out. I'd be like, all right, I've done so much work today. Like this panel is so good or this figure looks so good. But then I would zoom out and see like 167 like empty pages. And that would totally psych me out and be like, I would feel like I didn't do anything. And I realized that I did have a system for getting things done per day. Like I knew I had to do four pages per day, but still visually being aware that I have to do all these other pages 
started psyching me out. I started getting anxious. It slowed me down. And for that, I had to do something. I didn't know what to do. So I created a new layer where I just blanked out. Like, so if I had to do four pages for the day, I would blank out the other 164 pages. So I couldn't see anything else. Like all I could see on my file was those four pages. And then I would just work on those four pages. And once I got those four pages, so if I got a page done, I would zoom out and I would just see three empty pages. Then I knew, okay, I got 25% done, right? Rather than I got 1% done. So I'm really like focusing on the day itself and it felt really good. And that's it. I wouldn't care about tomorrow. I wouldn't care about, I cared about what I did yesterday because I felt good about what I did yesterday, but I wouldn't look forward at all. I mean, I have a plan like, I mean, once a week, I would look at the whole thing and see how much I did if I was on track. But it's just really helpful to kind of, you have to be in both. Like you can't be at both places at the same time. Like that's be like a tomorrow you that is looking at the whole plan for the next whatever one year. And there's a today you that is just, you know, doesn't need to know all that. That today you just needs to know that these are the four pages you got to get done today. And you get that done, you're happy. And then tomorrow you work on the next one. So you just you just put your head down and you just work on that and those four pages for the day. And then the next day, the same thing. And it goes on and on. And, you know, within a month or whatever time it is, it's you kind of you're surprised by how much you've done. Because you always just looked at those four pages at a time. You look back and see that, like, I'm surprised I've done uh like a hundred pages. I think I've done 130, 140 pages and I'm surprised. Like it's overwhelming to have to me to even think that I've even done that. But so imagine how it would be looking forward to that. So um, that has really helped me. Now it's really important. Like when you figure out like what, you know, what, how much are you capable of doing per day? Like you have to be realistic. You have to really know that, okay, so this is how much I can, get done this is how much time i have and this is what i got to do it's really important to be realistic because for me like so anthony talked about zero day like so there are days where i have zero days but i still have to do it like it, it might be bad there's some days where it's going to look terrible and it just like you just have to get through those four pages but you get through it and like um like anthony was saying like that's maybe that's the first draft and you can get back to it, but it's better to get it done than to not get it done. Um, so that's really important. And um, and then like Ramon was talking about, it's important that when you're doing those things that you have the right space to do it. Like you have a time of day when you work really well. And um, I think those are mostly, that's mostly what I, what I wanted to talk about over yeah. there. If I could just uh, yeah. book in that, I didn't want to talk about it in my section because I knew you were going to talk about it, but yeah, uh, I often call what you're, you're doing is uh, focusing on the battles, not the war. You chip yeah. away and you don't mm -hmm. look at the bigger picture because it could be overwhelming. So yeah. in those days where you compartmentalize your work, you know, six hours, you're going to do four pages. That's mm -hmm. all you worry about. And then next yeah. thing you know, you have 180 pages done because you're doing it every day or if yeah. it's a personal project once a week or whatever it might yeah. be. And you're not mm -hmm. stressed out about the bigger picture. And I think that's why I think that that helps you focus without the pressure of feeling overwhelmed, as you were saying. Mm -hmm. you know yes, I mean? yes. Yeah. You totally have to have faith in the process. Like you yeah. have to have faith yeah. in the process of what it happens, right? You could write one word a day. You could draw one line a day, mm -hmm. but eventually you'd be done. Yeah, exactly. Because you're, you're, because yeah. no, nobody can take away from you whatever you actually complete. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. Like the little bits, you know, and as kind of what you were referring to as well, Donna, sometimes those days may, might be bad days. Like uh, mm -hmm. the drawing might not be the best, but at the end of the day, it has to get done and finished, mm -hmm. you know, and probably yeah. something that you might think is bad to the viewer might still be great because you're going to be your harshest judge. You know yeah. what I mean? So is that, I guess uh, we're running short on time. So we'll let yeah. Kalman yep. uh, take over. 
Hey, I'm Kalman Andrushovsky. Uh, prepare yourselves. We're going to go in a very different direction now. Uh, I've been in the RAID studio for, uh, I don't know, 17, 18 years now. I've been a creative professional all of my adult life. Uh, I've worked in gaming properties like Star Wars and Dungeons and Dragons, uh, comics from Marvel, DC, Independent, the whole shebang, the whole gamut, all the nerd medias, as I like to say. Um, and you've heard from three very highly functional organized minds here who have talked about the ways they protect their time, they compartmentalize, they schedule, and uh, that stuff is extremely important and useful. But I thought <laughs> it might be useful to hear from someone who has struggled with these sorts of things. Um, I, uh, I have always been a little bit more, uh, how can I put it? right-brained in the way that I organize my time. Uh, and those have been some of my strengths and weaknesses. So these are, these are very good, uh, clear, solid systems. But I thought, because I've fought this battle with myself about productivity, motivation, maintaining focus, maintaining uh, energy and forward momentum, maybe uh, I'd give you some of my insights, which are gonna be uh, very, <laughs> more of a winding path. So, uh, in my personal life, um, I've had two re recent and professional life. I've had two big game changers. The first is I began teaching. I teach art at Centennial College. And looking at how I have to filter information and make it teachable and that give students experiences that create a spark of understanding or learning has changed the way I look at the way I have applied knowledge in my own work. And also I've been diagnosed with ADHD very late in life. And these two things have shifted the way I work and the way that I deal with my own motivation and my own creativity and my own practice in a massive way. So this is not gonna be an ADHD talk, but three quick facts. ADHD is neuroatypicality. It's not a mental illness. It's more akin to being on the autism spectrum. Um, and ADHD in particular is a spectrum. You can have it a little and a lot, you can have it in some aspects and not others. Dale Archer wrote a book called ADHD Advantage, which talks about this. There's a media depiction of ADHD, which is very visual and specific and intense. And there's actually a whole range of ways it can manifest. Lastly, uh, it's estimated that 90% of adult cases of ADHD are undiagnosed. Make of that what you will. Um, what I found is a lot of the strategies for managing ADHD map really well to managing creative struggles as well, because ADHD brains map really well to what culturally is known as the artistic temperament. Uh, I'm not saying all creative people have ADHD, but there's a lot of overlap there. And so um, the first thing I'm going to talk about in regards to that is something you may have heard in school. I encountered this idea in high school. I loved it as a young, uh, young uh, flaky artist type, uh, follow your bliss. I didn't look up who that quote is. I can't remember right now. It's a writer who's known for many famous things, but uh, I loved this when I was 15, but by 18, I had dismissed it as flaky nonsense that was getting in the way of actual productivity and making my way in the quote, real world. Um, I've kind of come back around to it now though. So ADHD brains and creative minds tend to be motivated by three key things, interest, novelty, and stress or pressure. If you're somebody who says, I perform well under pressure, you may have this kind of brain. Um, it's part of what being artistic and creative is. It's part of what makes your insights interesting to other people in the world. The problem is, is these are kind of the only three things. The things that tend to motivate the world at large, like money or success or fame, or I will be able to buy that thing I want. These things are not motivating to a creative brain. They're too distant. They're too disconnected. It's, it's, it's about immediacy and response and emotion. So the problem is, is that you were trained by the world to motivate yourself by these things that aren't always working for you. So interest is great. Interest is great, but the jobs you get when you're a freelance creative professional don't always map perfectly to your interests. They can, you can get 50% or 80%. Once in a while you luck out, work on something you really is perfectly aligned with your own creative goals, but rarely. And you have other people uh, working into it. You have art directors, you have client needs, and it's never gonna be a case of you doing exactly what you want if you're being paid. Then there's novelty. 
Anything new is exciting. A new job, a new gig, a new client, a new challenge. Awesome. That's a ticking clock. That's a ticking clock that slowly runs out and ultimately even works against interest. And finally, you have stress or pressure. And this is the only thing that makes you finish things, but it really takes a toll. It burns you out, it exhausts you, and you kind of end up having an abusive relationship with your own creative process if the only way you finish things is through the path of stress and punishing things. So why am I not doing the thing? This is the question that I often asked myself before I understood these three key motivations. This is what I wanted. This is what I dreamed about. This is what I sacrificed for. Now it's time. So why am I endlessly revising notes and thumbnails and not starting? Why am I picking up my phone constantly? Why am I getting up and getting snacks or binge watching or stress eating or avoiding? Why? Because I'm missing that stimulation. I'm missing those key three things that my creative mind needs to progress. Artists just need more of that. We need novelty, we need stimulation, we need those things. It's not shallow, it's not undisciplined, it's just how we're wired. That's how we make the things we make. That's the fuel that allows us to do the thing we do, but the world at large doesn't explain that. And you struggle with yourself. You, you fight yourself because the world says, well, you start at the beginning and you incrementally go forward again. Those structures are important once you understand your own internal motivations. But if you haven't understood your internal motivations, all the structures and rules and, and, and uh, systems in the world aren't gonna help you. So I realized that if I'm not working on the thing, if I'm not doing the thing, I should at least be working. I should at least be sitting here and making something because if I can't progress on the thing, Getting a snack or leaving the house or goofing off and binge watching is not getting me closer. But if I'm at least making something, I'm revving that creative engine. And so I engage with something called the warm up drawing, which lots of artists talk about, particularly artists who are in house somewhere at a game company, an animation company, where they have crushing amounts of client work that are very far from novelty or interest. Um, it seemed insane to me that somebody would draw to unwind or draw to get away from drawing. Um, and I avoided it for years. But drawing something for myself before I start on the work of the day has completely reinvigorated my personal creative process. It's a happy start. It's a dopamine endorphin bath to get me in the right frame of mind and get me happy. Whatever else I'm struggling with after, I'm better equipped to move forward through it. And I've gotten way better at drawing. And I've produced a massive body of work. Uh, it's a time to experiment. It's a time to play. These things are dismissed by the capitalistic world at large as not relevant or valid. But if you're a creative, you need it. It's important. And so it has been hugely uh, rejuvenating for me to just work in a personal drawing or something every day, a little bit. Set a timer. Once in a while, it eats the day. But that's still OK, because in the big picture, I'm moving the muscles. I'm practicing the craft and it makes me more inclined to step in next to the thing that I need to do. So much, uh, what else? Okay, the problem is if you take this approach, you will be sitting and working more. There is a capitalist philosophy that you need to minimize labor and maximize profit. This thing about thinking about every minute you spend at the desk generating money and the faster you can do it, you make more money. That's all true. But why are you doing this? Why aren't you a stockbroker? You're doing this because in theory, you should enjoy the process. Otherwise, why, why, why torture yourself? This is not the way to get to money fast. So more time at the desk making is not a loss. It's a win. I, furthermore, uh, more time spent making is a win in regards to the process by which you do your work as well. I have lost so much time locked in silent battles with myself, wrestling over the efficient way to finish the thing versus the thing I want to do, the way I want to do it, which is creatively interesting to me. Maybe it's more experimental, maybe it's more laborious. But then the other part comes in and says, no, no, you have to make dollars, you have to minimize, you have to be efficient. And I just lose so much time locked in that battle, not doing anything, that just embracing the fact that I know I'm a creative and I need 
to take that winding path, not the direct path, because at least if you're on the winding path, if you divert and draw something by hand that you could do more quickly digital because it's more fun, ultimately what I've learned for me, and I think for people like me, is you will keep drawing, you will keep doing the thing, and you will get to the finish line more with far more certainty than if you try to fight yourself and push yourself down the, uh, the path that is technically more correct, but not stimulating, not satisfying, not enjoyable. And you will have a more enjoyable work life, which will translate into more motivation, more wanting to do the thing instead of struggling all the time. So there you go. That's my take on this whole shebang. That's Def definitely a different, uh, different approach, a little more uh, conceptual. I think it's, I think it's different, but it also kind of relates to all, everything we do. Like it's all, we all complement each other, I think, in the different aspects. Cause I know like I have a hard time sitting at the table and, you know, things force me to sit there for different reasons, but I, you know, like probably a reason why I take on multiple projects is because I have a hard time focusing on one for too long. Do you know what I mean? So I, I think everything we've said here kind of interrelates and we just approach it in our, our own weird, unique manners that make Yeah, you're giving yourself stimulation through variety. Yeah, exactly. Right? That variety keeps you engaged. And that's true for me too. I've worked on, yeah. I worked on two big projects over the last year, both games. One was very realistic, Victorian, uh, period, intensive research and the other one was like cute colorful cartoon characters and being yeah. able to have those two things were the work but they were so yeah. different so different um really good for my creative brain to feel That's stimulated sure. and engaged and it's yeah like it worked really efficiently on those um, well should we go to some questions now yeah let's do some questions do some q a yeah so uh the first one here how to balance multiple hobbies projects I think we've we've kind of really touched upon how to answer multiple projects, but one thing that, that I, I will, I think, add to this is when we talk about hobbies. So um, Calman and I both, you know, really like video games, right? And I mention this because maybe you like video games, maybe you like d doing any sort of other thing. You like watching eight hours of Netflix, whatever, right? you cannot consume more than you create or you, or you won't get finished, right? Like, like if, if you want to write a novel, but spend all of your free time playing video games, that's fine. Like you, you, you get to do that, right? This, no, no, nobody's forcing you to write your novel, but again, this kind of clicks back to protecting your time, right? Like yeah. hobbies are fantastic but you, you have to have a good sense of, of what you can actually achieve in your spare time. And to, to that, right, and this, this is connected with, with my idea that really the whole world is math. And I know that this kind of freaks people out when, when, when I, I, I mention this kind of stuff, but there's a website called howlongtobeat.com. And you can go there and you can look up how long it takes the average person to finish a video game. And I looked up like every video game that I have on my PlayStation from like PlayStation Plus or whatever, right? I like over 500 hours of video games still to play. If I, if, <laughs> if, 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 if I just played those video games instead of writing, that's 500 lost writing hours, right? Yeah. I'm not saying that, that, that you can't ever do extra hobbies or extra fun things, but you have to be honest with yourself about how much time you're dedicating to your creative endeavors and to things that like are fun and, and yeah. that you also need in your life, right? That's all. Well, yeah, I think it's important to like, uh, as a person who kind of, uh, for a long time, I didn't have hobbies. Work became my hobby because I was always either drawing comic books in one manner or another. In this recent, is the danger, right? When your yeah. dream becomes your job, suddenly yeah. you get very one-dimensional and obsessed. yeah and, and, and it's hard so i know in recent years i've tried to start working back in hobbies whether it's being a little bit of mechanic work because uh, i ride motorcycles or uh building stuff with lego or i know like anthony paints paints miniatures yep. i think it's important to give yourself uh, a day an evening or whatever it might be uh, where you can look forward to these things. So whether it be, oh, you know, every Thursday night, I'm going to game with my friends online or paint a miniature for three hours. Uh, 
if you at least a lot of time when you have uh, to look forward to these things, it gives you another thing and you're like, you know, like, oh, I'm working hard today, but I know tomorrow uh, for four hours, I'm going to chill out and just like paint miniatures and, and have my own time. So I think it's it, just important. To yeah, this question is different depending on your situation. So yeah. Yeah. like like Ramon and I both had a situation where drawing was our hobby and then we became full-time professionals. And yeah. Where, where do you go to escape? So in recent years, I started a vintage clothing picking and selling business with my wife and that's become my hobby. That is a business technically. So it has a goal to it. It's not just <coughs> aimless, but it's, it's relatively like it's, it's, it doesn't directly compete. It's a, uh, you know, a couple of times a year we go to to events and when we're out we're just we just enjoy picking that's yeah. a hobby yeah. if you are if you do have a day job which is a, certainly a, a situation that a lot of creatives have then suddenly your hobbies are at war with your creative endeavors because you have that set free time and what's it going to be like anthony was talking about mm -hmm. and these are yeah. slightly different struggles around the same subject yeah what do you next up uh, anthony yep. here uh so when you're starting out, how important is the idea that, that you have, at least in the context of being able to train yourself to get the work done? Anybody want to take a uh, seat? So the quality of the concept? Like, sure, like, like, let's say, I mean, I think that, you know, just in terms of, uh, to, to start off, I would say that don't wait for the perfect idea before you're starting. Yeah. Right, like, like, like I, I would kind of say, yeah, that. there's a tendency to be precious and think, like, oh, I'm not good enough to do that really awesome thing that I want to do one day, yeah. Um, or, but or you can always be better and you'll always look back and go, ooh, I wasn't so good back then, yeah. If you're growing, which is the goal, but there's something to be said for giving yourself a manageable challenge and not starting with the 12 volume epic you've been writing with your friends <laughs> since junior high yeah. and uh, start and complete something small and go through the process of yeah. uh, building and finishing something that you can have a victory under your belt and move forward more confidently. Yeah, yeah. I think it's also um, artists or creatives getting caught up in, especially if you're working on your own project, uh, you can get caught up in the foundational work, research, uh, costume design, character design, uh, planning things out to no degree where you almost extend that phase ad infinitum and you never actually get to the project because you feel you're not ready yeah. or it's too big. So you just keep focusing on the research or the, the designs. And sometimes I think uh, it's good to put a time limit on that and then at one point um, just dive in and do it. And you can always uh fix it with the you know as you go forward or you can adjust it or you can as once it's done you say the next one will be better like i think um i know anthony's spoken to this in other talks where there's two types of writers there's the pantser and then yep. there's the what's the other one i am blanking plotter plotter because i'm the yeah. i'm a pantser i just like dive in and go by the seat of my pants and eventually move into a plotter i kind of combine the two but i know if i stay too long at the plotting stage i never get done so i often will plot for a bit and then dive in by the seat of my pants. And then once I'm in a groove, I work in the plotting phase behind the scenes on the project. So there's different ways we can work, but what, you have to find out what works best for you at the end of the day. Yeah, yeah John, John Cleese has a, has a talk, you can find it on YouTube uh, from the 90s, where he's giving a talk on creativity to some corporate Oh, I know the talk. Yeah, yeah. And he talks about the open mode and the closed mode. Seeing this was another massive like brain shift for me and thinking about creativity as as both spark joyful spark of creation versus execution and getting it done. And he's talking to a room full of middle managers. So he's talking about how you are all in closed mode, which is what we do when we have to hit a deadline, we have to get it done. You need to learn about the open mode. And I was like, all I have is open mode. Tell me about closed mode. <laughs> um, but that's sort of what you're describing too. Like the initial joyful barf draft where everything's coming together and I, things are smashing together and working is like, it's important. That's the pantsing part. But then you also need the closed mode. You need to apply rigor and like put it together. And they're completely mm -hmm. different and yeah. some people are way more on one side. Some people are way more on the other. Like that difference between pantsers and plotters is, is a similar metric of like, where are you more comfortable, open mode or closed mode? But to create something, you kind of need both and they need yeah. to work together ultimately. Yeah. Um, 
any advice on how to uh, avoid having zero days stack up, right? So one thing that, uh, that I, I, I will say to, to uh, like, is that you, you, you have to almost treat every day l- l- like a brand new day, right? Like, like think of it in terms of if you're rolling the dice, right? Dice doesn't know what the previous dice roll was because your chances are always you'll get one of six numbers that comes up, right? If they're all ones in a row, the dice doesn't know that. It just happens to be all ones, right? So if you've had a bunch of zero days, that doesn't matter. Make today not a zero day, right? Like the first step to going to the gym every day is going to the gym any day. And you have to always be okay with with that and that kind of mindset because like a lot of times we think to ourselves i'll start a project on monday i'll i'll start it on new year's i'll start in september because that's when school starts right doesn't matter you can start a project on any random tuesday because yeah. it's the next day right and i feel like that has always helped me you know get over worrying about too many zero days yeah. give yourself a reboot every morning the gift of a reboot yeah yeah you know yeah three more uh, minutes here that's i think we have maybe maybe one more question uh we'll try to do because i think some of the other ones have kind of been uh do you guys find it easier to complete a client project versus a personal project and then do you have any advice on how to complete personal projects and i think a lot of this kind of connects together with some of the other questions as well balancing personal projects and client projects yeah i mean for me it's like obviously the client project's the easier one because you have a deadline and you know if you don't make that deadline, it can have uh, professional repercussions on what you're doing uh, or future work for that matter. So obviously that's the easier thing to handle, whether it's an all nighter or whatever gets you there, it gets you there. The, the more difficult one is the personal projects where you're self-motivating and that can be things where I know over the years I've stopped and, and started on many personal projects, some never to be finished, some hopefully to return to. And I think, uh, as you know, I, all the things we talked about here today, I think apply to allowing you to focus on uh, getting there with your personal projects. And I think the, one of the best ways is what, what kind of what Donish was alluding to was chipping away. So the more you get done in small increments, next thing you know, you'll have a whole novel, a whole graphic novel, a whole comic, whatever it is done. So don't, don't worry about finishing your whole graphic novel this week, finishing, worry about finishing one or two pages of your graphic novel this week, or one even, or three panels, whatever you can handle. Yeah. So you're at least chipping away at that uh, element. And then- Yeah, client work it, has external motivators. Yeah. They have, like Ramon said, the, uh, the embarrassment of failing, the validation from the client, the payment, the feeling of being done, the fact that people are waiting for it. These are all important external motivating factors that even if you struggle with your personal work, these will push you forward. Even if it's at the last minute, you yeah. will go across the, 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 the finish line one way or the other yeah. because of that stress, that anxiety, that need to please, that yeah. need to complete. It's much harder with personal projects because you have to apply those to yourself. And if you're the personality type that isn't organized like some of these guys with schedules and one step at a time, it, it can really fall apart. Furthermore, the problem is, is that if you're struggling to apply those, even with client work, applying that external casing to something that should be magical, it should be a dip in the, you know, the, the tears of God to find that project. It should be an escape. It should be fun. But if you want to get it done, it can't be just infinite play. You have to get closed mode. And that feels like a real a wound sometimes like yeah. wait this shouldn't feel like that job that i had to hack out and stay up all night for this should be rejuvenating but it's not and again it sort of ties into what this whole talk has been about which is finding balance between open and closed mode mm-hmm. and even yeah. if you're a full-time professional you have to maybe then treat that that project more like a hobby in that it, yeah. it slots into what you're doing when you're not working like or anthony's yeah dealing with how he's going to use his evenings and yeah, applying the, the not zero day. It's a little bit tragic to make that. All right. So we, yeah. we, we, we've reached our end. We like to just quickly sort of each say where you can find us all online, please head to raid.world. Also, please feel free to join the raid discord server. We will answer 
any more questions that you guys have there. You can find me online at anthonyfalcone.ca. If you want to hear more about me, sign up for the newsletter there. Ramon, where can they find you online? Uh, I am, you can find me at ramonperez.com, which pre pretty much has links to all my social medias and uh, also on raid.world, which is our studio site. I just posted a bunch of links in the chat section if people are curious. But yeah, fairly simple. Dinesh, where uh, can they find you online? Uh, you can find me on Instagram at, I don't know if this is a reflection. <laughs> at Danish. <laughs> You're good. Danish Mo. At Danish Mo. That's me on Instagram. Yeah, and man. all the members of uh, the studio here have all their social media on the raid.world under their profiles as yeah. well, if you need to reach out to them. Yeah, yeah I'm at Evil Kalman on Instagram and Twitter. I am Kalman is my portfolio site. I'm not super active on Twitter, but I post lots of warm-up drawings on Instagram. <laughs> Bravo. That's awesome. Uh, thanks so much, guys, for uh, our, the kickoff panel for Word Balloon Academy 2020. Uh, that was a, a great way to kick it off. Uh, and I feel very motivated now to uh, start hitting the drawing table myself, which has been far too long. Um, uh, special thanks to uh, this year's presenting sponsor, Seneca College School of Creative Arts and Animation. Uh, of course, also special thanks to the Beguiling Books and Art, uh, Page and Panel, the TCAF Shop, uh, as well as our government funders who help support today's program, uh, the Canada Council for the Arts, the Ontario Art Council, uh, and the Toronto Art Council. Uh, if you have not been to it yet, uh, RAID has a profile at toronto.com, uh, along with 300 other artists from all over the world. Um, and go there, uh, browse, um, you know, uh, artists from 10 different countries, check out once. Um, and uh, it's a, a fairly uh, seamless experience. Uh, and we have programming running all uh, week until next Saturday. Uh, up next for WBA is the uh, Behind the Merch Table uh, with Jazlyn, Kiki, uh, and Kieran. Uh, that starts at 1230. Uh, uh, and we'll touch on everything but turning your art into merchandise. So uh, from creating distribution logistics, being a one person customer service department, uh, and also a little bit of tra uh, uh, maintaining that life work balance that we talked about uh, just now. So that starts in uh, just over 25 minutes. Uh, you can find that all on uh, torontocomics.com. And once again, thanks so much, uh, Dinesh, uh, Anthony, Ramon, Helen, that was a great uh, kickoff for today. Thank you for having, having us. Thank you. Thank right. you so much, man. Bye, everybody. We'll see Bye. you later.